So my name is Christopher Gardner. I'm a professor of medicine at Stanford University. I'm the director of nutrition studies. I'm in the division that's called the Stanford Prevention Research Center. And after 20 years of pretty consistent NIH funding and not really getting much behavior change in the population around diet, my latest interest is changing social norms. That's what I think the country needs. And I don't think there's ever been a time like the present for doing that. I think it's partly a, a perfect storm of the diabetes epidemic happening and the internet bringing the transparency to the ridiculous conditions that animals are grown and slaughtered in and human laborers are treated in. Um, it's the millennials who are taking a greater and greater interest in food and with their smartphones, they can see where the food comes from. It's a bunch of issues that are resonating about food. So. I'm trying to link all the seven schools on the Stanford campus, as well as the design school, several interdisciplinary programs, Stanford Dining, and others around this idea of how do you get substantial behavior change? I feel like a lot of our nutrition studies in the past have been, to get funded, very reductionist. This one nutrient for this one outcome and this one kind of person. And often it doesn't work it wasn't long enough to wait or the dose wasn't big enough or it wasn't a massive enough change. So John, when people go on your diet, it's a massive change. And when you do that, then you can see some really substantive changes in metabolism, how people feel, but just taking the Twinkie diet and shooting some nutrient into the Twinkie seems to be what America thinks nutrition should be. Just find that one magic nutrient. No, 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 this is like completely change the way you eat and do it for a while until you like it and it's craveable and you can sustain it and then feel it. And if you do that, there are people with stories to tell, but for the people that they're talking to, they go out there and the social norm is not that way. The social norm, I'll give you a story that we have from our pediatrics unit which is one of the reasons that Lucille Packard has recently made some huge substantive changes to their dining hall, as they had just been giving a bunch of kids who were overweight a talk about health and nutrition and their diabetes. And the kids walked out, and it was February Valentine's month, and there were brownies and ice cream and soda outside the door. And one little kid looked up and said to one of their instructors, isn't this just the food that you told us not to eat? And and it's in the hospital, and the hospital is where we should be safe and taken care of. And I've heard the Lucille Packard folks tell that story as one of the mechanisms the CEO and the other folks use as narrative, not a scientific research paper, but as a narrative, say, people hear that story and say, oh my God, that is so wrong. And more than any research paper could ever publish, that kind of stuff is coming out. And so, what I'm trying to do at Stanford right now is to learn narrative and to learn design school iterative thinking and prototyping. Um, I'm trying to look for philanthropic, philanthropic um, streams of revenue so I don't have to go to the NIH and make this incremental change and this next incremental change. We're looking for big changes. We want to see radical changes in the diet, which is going to take people producing food in a different way and preparing it, delivering it, um, CSA boxes being more available, more people going to farms, more people knowing their farmers, more people cooking. Cooking has to be cooler, the old home economics thing we had in school, we can't bring that back, but we have to bring some really cool cooking stuff back to school. I'm seeing stuff pop up all over the country and especially all over in my greater Palo Alto area that is so exciting this summer farm camp that I've been running for four years as this community-based participatory research project. We're just getting tons of interest and this ongoing presence at Full Circle Farm, where we take kids and they're on the farm all day playing games and eating vegetables and harvesting them and cooking them and eating them. And on Fridays, when their parents come for camp to pick them up, we have pizza day. So we cook pizza in a cob oven with whole grains and then we put a little tomato sauce on it and they have to cover all the tomato sauce with vegetables that they harvested. And their parents show up and they say, my kid won't eat that. And then all the pizzas are gone. 
And that some of the parents have tears in their eyes. And they say, how did you do that? Well, we had them at camp all week and they tended them, they harvested them. We gave them sharp knives and they chopped them themselves and they cooked them. They had ownership in this food. That's a completely different kind of study for me. That's so different than my, hey NIH, give me a bazillion dollars and I'll isolate this one nutrient and I'll check their cholesterol level two weeks later. This is getting engagement in food as a value system and linking food to societal values where it runs a lot deeper than your personal health. And this is what I'm excited about. And this is the kind of thing I really think we're on the verge of changing social norms if we can pull a lot of these enthusiastic projects and people together. I feel like we've lived in too much of a silo. It's really not just about nutrition and it's really not just about preventing cardiovascular disease and cancer. It's about being alert and thriving and being at your best and loving the taste of food and being experimental and, and seeing the source of your food and seeing that it's not destroying the planet. And so when I bring in the business school perspective, the legal perspective, the civil engineering perspective of people who are trying to do some urban planning to make sure that there's an urban garden replacing that abandoned lot and that people are growing food and underserved people are making money doing that. They're feeding their own families and they're selling it to local restaurants to make money, to fuel the new local food, cool restaurant movement. I, I cannot even imagine being more excited than I am right now. So 30 years from now, I really hope this just continues and that my my epitaph reads, wow, this one guy, he linked food across all seven schools at Stanford and then figured out a way to disseminate that and include the world, the state, the country, the world. And I, I, I don't mean to be conceited or arrogant, but it is such an exciting time right now. Those things seem to be falling in place, so I couldn't be more excited. So let me tell you some fun I just had recently. So I was picked as the voice of reason and the moderator of a debate between Joel Furman and Lauren Cordain and Mimi Guarneri, who, was rep who has studied under Dean Ornish. And I thought she was going to represent the Ornish approach, but she didn't. She actually picked Mediterranean after having studied under him. So it was basically Joel presenting mostly vegan, very plant-based, and Lauren presenting the opposite. And partly I had fun doing it, partly what was stunning to me is how many people came up after and said, oh my God, I can't believe what you just did. These people are usually clawing at one another about their differences. And what I did is I got them to agree on a certain number of things. And so I'm gonna answer your question this way. I asked them all after their presentations, how, what percent of the American diet they thought came from refined grains and added sugar and packaged processed food that contained way more ingredients than we needed and really wasn't high quality food. They all estimated 70%-ish of the diet to come from that huge proportion. And then I said, and a lot of, all three of you said we should eat more vegetables. So what percent of the diet could realistically come from just vegetables alone? And they kind of settled on maybe 20 or 30 percent. So I said, you guys would all agree that 70 percent of the diet should go away and 20 to 30 percent should be bumped up in terms of vegetables. OK, now let's get down to this. What's the last 40 percent? And Lauren Cordain said all his paleo things and Joel Furman said grains and starches. And Mima Guarneri was a little more in the middle because of the Mediterranean diet. So that's where I'd like to be if we could get at the starting point where we found where we all agreed there's, there's really no controversy. We had way too much sugar, way too much refined grain, way too much packaged processed food. That's enormous. I mean, that alone is a daunting thing. If you got rid of that and then you made tasty vegetables. I mean, one of the reasons people may not like vegetables is they don't taste as good as some other things. But man, when you grow that heirloom tomato in season, when you just pick those carrots, when you have all those fresh vegetables and you prepare them, often minimally, um, they can be great, but there's still that 40% left of the diet that people argue about. So 
I want to be the one who helps design the studies that has that as a base, that base diet that everybody would agree on, and then head to head compare the other ones. Because my diet works great for me. I'm 55 years old. I rock climb, I play volleyball, I bike every day. I never get sick and I'm a vegan for the most part. I have chickens in my backyard and I have eggs so I'm a flex of veganarian. Most of my meals are vegan. I'm doing really well. I have people who look me in the eye who are extremely healthy, they don't get sick, they're very alert and they say, I eat the opposite of you. I, I can't look them in and I say, you're wrong and I'm right because they tell me they're eating the opposite thing and they're healthy. But they do share some of the commonalities. They're not eating added sugar, but they're eating lots of fat. They're eating lots of animal products. They're eating lots of these other things. Is that just because they're young and resilient and their bodies are tolerating it now? Or is it really healthy for them? I, I want to answer those questions, but in a fair way so that if you get the vegan, low carb, sorry, the vegan, low fat, grain based, starch based aficionados on board, you say, yes, I would agree that is the best kind of diet that way. And you get the other camp saying, yes, this is my best diet. I want to see those diets pitted head to head. I think that's fun. But when you get to that point, John, a, a challenge is when we get real life people to follow these diets, they don't do those two diets the same way. They do them in a number of different ways. Somebody really doesn't like broccoli, but they like cauliflower. Somebody really doesn't like wheat, but they like rye. Are those the same diet? Yes and no. And so I'm trying to thrive on that variability and understand it more because I think there's room for a certain amount of variability after you get past that baseline that we would almost all agree on. I want to understand that variability and is it true? Are there, is there human variability that different people thrive more on one diet versus another? And is it different for different people? Because I'm open to there being that difference. So the way I, I, want I want to help promote behavior change is to let everybody see what Ansel Adams or somebody said. You pull up this one thing in the ground and you find it's connected to everything. So you can't just say plant diet. You can't just say vegan. The people give examples of people who aren't vegans who thrived. But if we look at blue zones, that, was, that didn't come up today, those blue zones that are very plant-based. Oh yeah, I think there's plenty of evidence and I think that's better for animals, better for people. Yes, I'm certainly a huge plant-based proponent if, if that didn't come across before. But I'm also very open-minded because I, I am confronted by people who don't do that and they appear to be thriving. And I, I want to be open to that. I am not proselytizing my own personal diet.